Hello, and we are about to continue. Please welcome Darko Mesraš as our next speaker. Hello, everybody. First of all, uh, I heard there was an earthquake recently in Banja Luka, so I hope you already all did get push, just in case. So, welcome to the Tale of Two Pizzas, a story about development and developer tools on Amazon and AWS. Hopefully, I will talk to a few about a few things such as DevOps, the story about it from Amazon, and uh, some tools we offer that you can use and make your life easier. First of all, who am I and why should you care? My name is Darko Mesaroš. I originally come from Subotica, Serbia. Currently, I work as a specialist solutions architect for AWS, uh, living in Berlin, Germany. Fun fact, I, uh, in six years, seven years, I changed five countries. So from Serbia, Czech Republic, Malta, Ireland, and now Germany. What does a specialist SA do? Well, I specialize in management tools, infrastructure as code, DevOps, and I help our customers in the EMEA region directly with those technical deep dive problems. So why are we, why are we here today? I have a range on my, on my clicker, so not more than this. Uh, why are we here today? What are we going to talk about? I hope we can cover a couple of things. What is DevOps? The age-old question. Uh, I will talk about the Amazon DevOps story, uh, cover some AWS code services, the services we made to kind of help life of developers easier, uh, cover the entire DevOps portfolio, and um, I'm actually going to do a demo on stage. So uh, it's a real live demo, so let's hope it works. I did prepare a bit. Software moves fast today. If you haven't realized, it's 2019, the world of startups, Small companies with a great idea, unicorns, are able to overtake long-standing enterprises in the world. Companies such as Airbnb, um, you know, they overtook the entire hotel business uh, as a small startup, right? Or transportation companies such as Lyft and Uber, they all do this. There's no longer a time where you wait three months to deploy software. I used to work in a company back in Serbia where we would deploy software every three to four months and, well, I don't think that works anymore today. I cannot imagine deploying software once every three months anymore. So, so, what is DevOps? Does anybody here know what DevOps is? Actually know what DevOps is? Can anybody define DevOps? Is DevOps a person? Is it a role? Is it a DevOps.exe? So the way we define DevOps, at least how we like to square it off in AWS, is a set of cultural philosophies, practices, and tools that help you achieve this agility um, while being safe and doing quality software workloads, whatever you would like to call it. Before I continue, anybody here having trouble, trouble with DevOps? Nobody having trouble with, with DevOps? Anybody working in a DevOps environment? Anybody wants to work in a DevOps environment? <laughs> is anybody here not sure what DevOps is? Why do you don't think what DevOps is? You don't need to know what DevOps is. I will give you a book. Come, 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 come. I will give you a book. There you go, sir. This is the book called The Phoenix Project. It's a novel about DevOps. So it's a story about how a company transformed to an, from a non-DevOps to a DevOps-like company. If you haven't read it, do it. I read it three times. Love it. I have no slide about that book, but The Phoenix Project. And uh, it's, it was written by Gene Kim. And actually, a new book is coming out now called The Unicorn Project. So be on the lookout from that. So DevOps culture. That's first thing. And Nana talk a lot about these things, like not everybody does everything, and that's actually true. But what DevOps does is it removes those silos. It makes cross-functional themes, so you remove developers and operations. And this company I used to work with, uh, and we had, literally, I was, a, I was an ops guy, a sysadmin. We sat in one part of the room, and in another part of the room, separated by a wall, 
there was a team we called the app people. So they would develop this application, which was a mystery to us. And every three months, they would give it to us on a CD and say, please deploy, thank you very much. This worked. It didn't work. <laughs> a lot of times, they would give us bad software. We'd deploy and like, OK, we missed our window. We cannot deploy. Wait for months again. Let's see how it works. But removing this, putting these teams together, you help yourself move much faster, bringing to share responsibility. In the old days, you had the app people who were responsible for the application, and the ops people, or dev, uh, operations system admins, who were responsible for everything else. There was a lot of finger pointing here, right? So, oh, I will worry about the application, and, but you just worry of have, giving me enough memory for my server. Um, that's all gone. We share responsibility. We own this product. We don't own a code. We don't own the server. We own the product. So anything from the op operational tasks to development to the entire pipeline, we own that. Um, brings us to ownership, right? Um, what's also important and really key about DevOps is there must be visibility and communication. You must be able to talk to each other, be that on Slack, IRC, a phone call, God forbid, right? Anything, you just need to talk and you need to visualize what is happening. The application people need to know what's happening. And also the operations people need to know what kind of changes the application people are making. So this kind of goes into the pattern of microservices, right? So from a big monolith to a whole bunch of microservices. I'll explain to this in a bit detail, but uh, eliminating a need for having one big lump that does a single thing, or that does a lot of things, actually, to smaller chunks of your code, of your application logic, that does one thing specifically and does it very good. So if a small change in that would not break everything, hopefully. DevOps is also CI/CD. Some people told me when I asked them, what is DevOps? Oh, it's a pipeline. No, it, there must be a pipeline in DevOps somewhere, but it's not. I'll talk about CI-CD a little bit. But CI-CD is important, right? It's important to take things from one end to the other as automatically as possible. DevOps is also infrastructure as code. Luca mentioned uh, CloudFormation, right? This is a horrible example of CloudFormation because it's written in JSON. And, you know, myself, I'm not a robot. I hate JSON. Uh, I hate YAML as well, but what can you do? So in defining everything you run, defining all the servers, all the networks, all the serverless functions as a piece of code, no matter what, service, what software you use for that. But that's important. And finally, this end loop, this is a lot of the people don't think about it, is monitoring and logging or being aware of understanding the workload health. If you do not know what a change, what kind of an impact has a change made to your software, you're doing it wrong. So every push to production, you need to be able to see, is there a difference in your KPIs, in your performance, in the memory usage, in whatever, right? You need to be aware of that. So monitor, unlog, and understand. Be aware of what is what doing. Benefits of DevOps, right? Uh, I think we all understand the benefits of DevOps, but again, we move at more speed with DevOps. It gives us this uh, rapid delivery and, and, and speed in, in delivering our piece of software or our workload. It improves this collaboration between teams, even between different DevOps teams. Security, number one. With proper DevOps practices, you can build in security. You no longer have a security person. You build in security to your application from writing it in code to writing appropriate tests inside of your application and your infrastructure while deploying that. Of course, you can do this thing at scale, and that's important because we talk about the cloud. OK, story time. Look back at development at Amazon. So I'm talking about Amazon.com, not AWS. This is way back before AWS was a twinkle in Andy Jesse's eye. This is Amazon.com. Back in 2001, Amazon.com was a big old monolith. It was a monolith written in C++. It took 24 hours to compile. So any change, a button change, uh, or the way the, the shopping basket works, you have to compile the software every 24 hours. 
You can imagine the speed of delivery we could, we could afford with 24-hour compile times. And a lot of different teams working on this. So we decided to, and back in 2009, so we decided to move to a concept of microservices and a concept of two pizza teams. Back then, we actually didn't call it microservices. We called it primitives. I guess that name didn't catch on, but um, we split up that monolith into small chunks that everything does everything for itself. Shopping basket is this, the UI is this, and this element is that, and that element is this. And again, you have a lot of different teams. This brings me to the concept of two pizza teams. Anybody heard, heard about two pizza teams? Yeah, front row did. So what is a two pizza team? It's a very vague term. It's you, could, you should not have a larger team owning a microservice that you cannot feed with more than two pizzas, right? So we don't know how the big the pizzas are. We don't know how much the team can eat. I can be a two pizza team myself, I guess, right? But it's a, it's, a, it's a rough number of like six to eight people which own everything. They own everything that is part of that microservice, from deployment policies to operations to the code itself. Not everybody does everything, mind you, but they all work together to own that. So fast forward to, uh, this is 2009. This is Amazon.com in 2009. This is the death sphere, right, or the death star, uh, where we have all of our microservices and the APIs interconnected with each other. Horrible thing. But did, did, did this help us to move faster? It helped us with change times. We, we reduced the compile time from 24 hours to potentially just a few seconds. And uh, changes could be implemented much faster because you, you change only a small thing. That was great, right? We were moving faster. It was awesome. Everybody was happy. But some things could be done better, right? The developers were not super happy about this. There's so many people, different processes. Um, we can do this better. So in 2009, we ran a, a survey, as we always do. We do this survey even to this day uh, to understand what the problem was, where was the issue. Turns out um, there's a lot of waiting time. You write your code, you wait. You get your code built, you wait. You deploy your test, you wait. And maybe then somebody deploys it to prod. So moving basically from minutes of writing code, I mean, I used to write code, you know, two lines of, it's just two lines of code. It really does take you two minutes if you know what you're doing. But then you have to wait maybe days for somebody to build that code. And that's just not cutting it anymore. So an entire change, a single change, which in theory, it takes only a couple of minutes to implement would last weeks. Can any of you imagine waiting weeks for your change to be implemented? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I can imagine this. I was a part of this. But um, um, I do not wish that on anybody else. So what we want to do, we want to cut a couple of things here. Right? How, about, how about we remove those days and that week to something shorter, right? I need a better clicker. Um, just remove that. Remove all that waiting. So we need to find a way. We needed to find a way how to remove all of that. So believe it or not, back in 2009, this thing was not so common. So we decided to build tools to help us. Right? So we built tools to automate our release processes. Um, we so um, very creatively call them pipelines. Pipelines gave us the ability to move code automatically from one stage of the, of the software development process to another without any middlemen, any people in between doing all that manual clickety clicks or approvals or tickets. You know, you have to call a guy, hey, did you test my software? Uh, no, later on. So, if you move things through, fa through pipelines, you are A, faster, B, safer, because you move everything in a very standardized way, and you have a clear overview of where your current change is at. So a couple of years forward, again, 2014, thousands of services, thousands of service teams, 
literally thousands of two pizza teams. Uh, we built microservices. We were practicing continuous delivery. We had all those pipelines. And we had so many different types of environments, right, from staging, betas, whatever, right? And we were able to deploy 50 million deploys, just as a sense of scale. That is 134,000 deploys a day, right? From going from, you know, once a day or once every four months to 134,000 a day is a, is a leap. So basically, that, that turned out to be very, work out very well. It made our developers happy. Every survey we ran, the developers loved our CI, uh, CI pipeline services. They, that's what made them happy. Myself, personally, I've committed code to an AWS service. I basically had an idea, and I knew how to implement it. I asked the service team, hey, guys, can I contribute this? They're like, here you go, the repo. Committed the code. Somebody does a spot check on it. That looks good. Did you write your test? What? Your test? Oh, come back. <laughs> write your test. Deploy your code. And in the matter of maybe a couple of uh, hours, I would say, or uh, less than an hour, my change was deployed to AWS production successfully. And it worked. Amazing. So these kind of things, we understood that this is something that our customers would love to do, right? How can we take what we learned and we built and deliver it to our customers, right? So where do you start? Where do you as a developer start? Because the goal of this is me, I will be talking about AWS services, but if you learn something here, not just from AWS, but learn to use these tools, so make your day easier, right? So talking about a common release process of software, this is how it looks like mostly. Four major stages. We have the source, where you're checking your code, where you do a git push before an earthquake, uh, where somebody actually looks at your code, and they say, yep, that looks very good. Please do continue. The next phase is build. In the build phase, guess what? We compile code. Uh, Again, it's 2019, not every, not, not every code, the code is compiled, but we also run unit tests. We run style checkers, maybe run some code metrics, code linters, right? So build is a lot of things. And in this modern world of containers, this is where we actually build that Docker image, and we will store it somewhere else. Ah, the test phase. Nobody knows what the test phase is, but this is where you run your integration tests. This is where you spin up a testing environment, where you have a person look at it manually or do it automatically. This is where you run your load testing, right? You need to understand, does your change actually change the capacity of your service? This is where you run security testing, penetration testing, all of those things that you need to ensure that your application is in high quality. And once it passes this bar, this is where you deploy to prod. How you do it? What is prod? Is prod serverless? Is prod a server? Is prod containers? Doesn't matter, right? So, talking about CI/CD, anybody can explain what CI/CD is? What does it stand for? Not the first row. You guys know. <laughs> <laughs> continuous integration, continuous delivery, or deployment. Both. It's actually both. Yes, it should be CI/CDD. CDD. So, continuous integration. What is continuous integration? A developer commits his code, and a magic process goes and builds it. And that's it. You get an artifact, which is a built piece of code. It's not tested against, besides just unit tests, but it hasn't been tested in a, in a testing environment and staging and everything. It has, you have an artifact that you can just manually take through testing and manually or automatically deploy. The first D. The delivery part is you commit your code, you build it, you run unit tests, actually test it in some proper testing environment. You run integration tests, penetration tests, load testing, all of that magic. But it's still gated because somebody needs to go and say, yep, this looks good, ship it. There's a gate. It's not fully automatic. The, the deployment process after that can be automatic. doesn't have to be. And the granddaddy of them all, continuous deployment. This is where you, from you checking your code to prod, everything is automatic. 
hopefully this is something that, you know, a lot of people can do. All right. AWS, the company I work for, does provide code services, which are, I must say, the best name services in AWS, because you ac actually can understand what they do from their names, unlike Neptune and, uh, I don't know, <laughs> every other service we have. <laughs> uh, AppSync, right? Um, so Amplify. Amplify, there you go, right? What does Amplify do? Nope. Dynamo, nobody knows, right? <laughs> I have Amplify stickers and DynamoDB stickers if you want. Um, OK, so we have these services. I will be talking about them in, in, in detail. But where do they fit in? I, I, I would understand that you can, you'll, you'll probably guess, judging by their names, but let me do my due diligence and position them. Source phase. Mm, code. Commit. Code commit. It's a service. It's Git, right? I'll talk about it later. Um, build. Code build, right? Testing. Code third-party services. <laughs> we, we have no official testing tool. Uh, this is where you would use third-party services, such as, um, um, what is it, uh, integration testing? I always forget. It's, uh, Selenium, yeah, for example, that. Uh, or some other, you can, you can use CloudFormation technically to provision uh, testing environment and those things, but it's not a testing tool in itself. And to deploy to production, it's, it's blank. It's code deploy. Yeah, wow. There you go. Now, I talk about these individual services. Amazing, right? All of them do magic stuff. But we need to find a way to connect them together. We don't, this would be a traditional way. This would not be DevOps if there was no one other service here. And that's code pipeline. That's a service that connects all of these services together to automatically move software from one point to the other, to the other, to the end profit, right? Now, one cherry on top is this, is another service we have. It's called CodeStar. Now, I, I think they chose the name because it's like code and then the asterisk, right? Because it kind of in in includes all of these services. CodeStar is a service that actually provisions all of these things for you in a very simple, easy, seven-click way, right? I will demo this actually later on. But what it does, it literally just provisions all of these um, services and, and actually some underlying infrastructure to run a very simple um, application. And as of recently, you can design your own applications in CodeStar, which is it's going to be um, clear later on. Additionally, we have some other services here that help in the DevOps portfolio or the tool chain from things such as CloudFormation and OpsWorks, where you handle your uh, infrastructure as code and, and configuration management with Chef or Puppet, to uh, monitoring and logging and operations with things such as X-Ray, CloudWatch, Config, and those fancy services. OK, let's go in detail. Building and testing your application. This is very important. And the service that covers that is CodeBuild. So what is CodeBuild? Uh, CodeBuild is, I would like to call it, and this is not a PR-approved statement, it's Jenkins Lite. Um, it builds your code. It does certain things to it. And it's very simple. So simply what it does, you provide it a commit, a zip file, a something. And you tell it, this is your artifact. Here, run a set of commands against it and spit something out. Right? So it runs serverless. It's basically a container in a black box with all the tools you require. You can also use your own container images if you want something specific. Uh, and it's charged by the minute. So the more optimized your build is, the more money, money you save, right? Um, and it's all managed by a single configuration file. You take a configuration file and say, hey, run these commands in the install phase, pre-build and build, and please then artifacts just spit out that jar file at the end of the, end of the day. And that's all. It, that's what it does. It takes that jar file and gives it back to the pipeline. Now, testing your code. Um, we talk, I think somebody mentioned testing your code. Does anybody here write tests before they write their code? 
Nobody actually, right? So in test-driven development, you write your unit test first, and then you write your code. But nobody does that, right? Um, testing is very much, there's no single way to do testing, as it says, it's a, it's a science and an art form. So you have to be very understanding what you want to test, how you want to test it. You cannot literally test everything. It's very difficult to do. But um, you need to be able to understand how you want your application to behave, what is a good, good built application, and what do you expect out of it. So when we talk about testing, at least this is how we look at it, where to focus your tests. Most of your tests should go to unit test. Helps you catch problems super early, right? Cap help, helps catch any problems w during the initial build slash test phase. It doesn't have to spin up a testing environment. It doesn't have to go through an entire dev staging process. Uh, it literally would catch it during the build phase. The service test, or the integration test, is the second part. Um, this is where you would test, it, test integration with other aspects of your workload. And uh, finally, the UI test, which I never did. So, uh, and the way you can do these things is um, code build can help you with unit tests, but everything else, code third-party tooling, right? So we built our code. Um, what we need to do now? Deploy it, right? We need to give it to a guy, right? We need to call up a sysadmin, hey, I have it on a disk. Could you please copy this to your Windows NT server? Uh, no, absolutely not. It's moving much faster, so we need to move fast with it. So the service to that, that does this is CodeDeploy. Um, it's an agent-based service. It's basically a service that, deploy, as the name says, deploys your code. You install an agent on a virtual machine. Now, the thing here, it doesn't have to be an AWS virtual machine. Most of the time it is, but it can be on-premises, a physical box, it can be in a different cloud, it doesn't matter. It can also deploy to Lambda functions, it can also deploy to um, ECS, to, to, to containers, right? Um, but the biggest aspect of this, and, and why I like this service, is that it understands rollbacks. It's able to roll back bad code. Uh, did anybody ever have to roll back bad code manually? Yeah? Right? I did it. There you go, yeah. Somebody deploys bad code and say, hey, this is, a, this is my file. Can you FTP it to the server? And I'm like, oh, the guy must have tested it. FTP it to a server? I'm like, ah, uh, no. Roll back to the old version. I'm like, what version? <laughs> I, I overwritten the files, right? I, I didn't create a, my application that back. Just copy it. Now, that's a problem, right? CodeBuild actually handles that for you. CodeBuild understands what was the previous state of your files, and if it can automatically detect, automatically, it has a health check. If your application is performing as it should, is it actually working? If it's not, it will automatically roll back to the previous versions of the files and tell you, hey, deployment failed, try again. Right? And I think that's very, very important. It has a, a lot of integration with third-party services. Um, it supports both blue-green and standard in-place deployment. For, who you do, for those of you who do not know what blue-green is, CodeBuild spins up an exact copy of your production environment, deploys the new version onto it. If it's successful, it shifts the traffic from the old one to the new one and kills off the old one, or it keeps it, away, keeps it for a while. How do you configure CodeDeploy? YAML, right? Uh, we have a YAML file that, that, that does all of this. You say which files, where do they go to, some permission stuff, and it also has hooks. It, has, it understands a life cycle of a deployment. Sometimes when you want to deploy an application, you want to stop your server, right? You want to stop a, certain, a thing running on your server, right? It can stop it. Once it copies the files, it can start and reload it or do something completely different, right? So this is what CodeDeploy actually supports. OK, building, deploying, that's all fine. That's, but that's sometimes like juggling, right? So we need to find a way to orchestrate all of this. And this is what, where we use a pipeline. And the service for that is called Pipeline. Um, as the name says, it's a pipeline service. It's actually uh, it's not like this. It's a vertical pipeline because the, our UX team uh, uh, saw that 
not a lot of people have super wide monitors, so it was easier to scroll down rather than left or right, so I guess. But it takes a piece of your code or artifact from one end to the other, or one end to the other um, through different stages, right? Um, it builds tests. It doesn't build and test. It uses services to build, test, and deploy your code. Um, and it's quite visual. It has different stages. Um, and actually, this is kind of how it looks. So you have a pipeline where you have an application where you build and deploy, right? And you have a pipeline here. Then you have a stage, which is the build stage. Within that stage, you have an action. And then you have a transition. Yes, that's the transition. Now, you can have multiple parallel action that you will build it, and then build it again, and build it in with different versions, and then do a bunch of different deploys. It's not just clear cut like this. You can make it much, much more complex. OK, pipeline, right? Um, what are we missing? Oh, no, no. Where do we get our code from, right? Ah, it's a, it's a directory called final underscore final final version, right? Or final.zip. No, it's code commit. What is code commit? It's an amazing service that is it's Git. It's our Git service. It's a, it's a fully hosted Git um, piece of software that relies on, on S3. So all the data sits on S3. There's an unlimited repository uh, size. It stores all of its indexes in DynamoDB, and it's by default encrypted. Uh, with KMS. So it supports all the standard Git tooling. Uh, we actually had people abuse the service. There's no repo size limit. So people would store <laughs> massive files on it because it was free, right? There you go. <laughs> you want to store music? There you go. Uh, don't do that, please. <laughs> so it looks like this, right? Standard Git, Git, push, pull goes to code commit, again, relies on S3, DynamoDB, and KMS. So it's built on top of very sturdy services. And I mean, it's the same Git experience. There's nothing magical about it, right? It's just a nice service that integrates with a lot of different services. It has hooks, right? So you commit a piece of code, it can automatically tr trigger a Lambda function that does something, right? Um, so it's very much integrated into the AWS ecosystem. That being said, Within the pipeline, you can pick and choose which services you want. If you do not like code build, you can plug in Jenkins. If you do not like Git code commit, you can use GitHub, right? It's up to you. And finally, it's CodeStar, right? This little cherry on top that you can use to create a project or, well, there's no project, right? There's a product. Uh, you can create a thing where multiple people can work on. And it will provision everything you need for it, including the, the infrastructure you want, all the CI, CD aspects of it, and you get a really nice, neat dashboard. Um, I guess I'll show that. Cool. Awesome. So I am in my CoStar service. Let us create a service for this one. Create a new project. I know. Is that not here? It's not, OK. Um, let's create a Python serverless application, right? Or should we do PHP? No. Um, I'll do Python because I have a demo prepared in Python. I need to keep the continuity. But to create a serverless Python web service, it's an API. I can click this button. That's one click. Give it a name, Banya Luca Demo. Nope, Banya Luca Demo. I will use code commit as my repo. I can choose to use GitHub, but I work for AWS, right? <laughs> um, CodeStar will create all of these things. It will create code commit. It will use code build to build, build, and test my code. It will also use CloudFormation to deploy this piece of code to a Lambda function. And finally, it will use CloudWatch to actually monitor this application so I can view it nicely. Awesome. Now, I have a pipeline. How do I write my code? What's the best editor? Visual Studio, wow, OK. Vim, Emacs, VS no? Code. VS Code, OK. Well, well no, actually, it's Cloud9. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, <laughs> I can't keep a straight face. Uh, <laughs> Cloud9, it's a browser-based IDE. 
it doesn't suck as much as it sounds, trust me. It's an IDE that runs in your browser. It has Vim mode. You can use Vim keys with it. Amazing. Let me show you. Cloud9, it runs inside of your environment as an EC2 instance. I select the smallest one, that's fine, click Next, and that's it. It will create an IDE that runs in a browser that I can actually choose to run into my laptop, my, my workstation at home, wherever. I can have a um, portable uh, development environment wherever I go. Plus, it allows you for pair programming. You have multiple people working on the same project at the same time. So you can see multiple people editing a file, which is always scary. But it helps in that. So while this is setting up, as any good cook, I have it already done, right? Go back to CodeStar. There you go. Successful. Ah. I have an environment. I have a co uh, CodeStar environment that has created a wiki for me. It has created a code editor for me. I have a commit history here, the finger pointing tool. I have a my pipeline from source, build, to deploy. And finally, I have my monitoring for my application activity. I can additionally connect it to Jira if that's a thing you like, but I will not. OK, so my application, it's this endpoint. But to be very cool on stage, I will use my terminal here. If I use HTTPI to do this, it's a serverless application that returns hello world, nothing else. It just spits out random JSON. Well, not random, hello world plus a timestamp. Let's try to modify this. Going back here, um, this is my piece of code. It is um, a, J a Python file that spits out hello world. Let's change that. Let's do this. Save. Now, this is Cloud9. It has a terminal built in because it's running on top of an EC2 instance. So it's a Linux machine, so you can do things such as you know, this. It's normal. Now, git add, not that, oops, change the language. Awesome. I've pushed my change to, uh, to my repo. Now, hopefully, in a second or two, I should see something changing on the pipeline. Just refresh. Scroll down. Awesome. G a code commit has detected that the commit has been made. It automatically triggered a webhook that is passing that commit, my latest commit, which you can see here, um, onto the pipeline. So it will go to code build, where we should be able to see it here. All right, it's building. If I go to code build, I can see the output of that build, which is currently in progress. I'll see here. See, it's, it's, uh, there's a massive log here. It's tailing at this log. All right. Can I do this? No. Oh. Cool. It's building. One, 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 right? Um, remember test-driven development? Ah, see? Why has it failed? Can anybody tell me? It had failed my unit test, right? I did, it by, I did this intentionally, so just to be funny, right? But um, it has failed a unit test. What is my unit test? If I go to here and to tests, my unit test expects hello world. This is a very specific unit test. It expects Hello World to be in the body of my response of my application. So again, change that. Save. Awesome. Now. It has failed. Nothing has gone on. Imagine this being a massive problem. I've, I'm a bad developer. I made a change that will truncate my database. It hasn't happened here, right? My good unit test has prevented that from entering any potential production environment 
and my change has not affected anything. So if I go back to my application and run this, I should still see hello world, even though I'm not me as a bad developer has committed bad code. Here in a couple of seconds, um, we should be able to see the build trigger off again, and this will go through the entire deploy process. Now, because this takes a while, let me show you another thing. Um, I mentioned Cloud9, right? I like to talk about how, how great it is. So I mentioned pair programming. That's a modern thing. A lot of universities do it. They like to have multiple people code the same thing. So I have my piece of code here, and I have my buddy Grunf helping me out. If I look at Grunf's browser, he's here, and he can say, he can add a piece of code, say, um, hello. Okay. And if I go back to my here, I can see that Mr. Grunf has made a change. So, and Grunf and, and himself can see my cursor being here. So this means that Grunf himself, hopefully, can go here and save the file and do git push, well, git add uh, push. If, if Grunf has permissions for this, and he should, awesome. He committed his piece of code back to here, and I should be able to see that, piece, that change coming in again, um, well, after this change has been provisioned, right? So currently, we have another source phase happening. The build will happen, and then the deploy will happen again once this, this entire provision goes through. I do believe I have ran out of time, but before I go, I need this. What have we done today? What have I talked about it? I've talked about two pizzas or the concept of a two pizza team. Never have more enough people that you can feed with two pizzas. Keep the team small, own everything. Use DevOps. If you do not use DevOps, what are you doing? It will help you move fast. It will have you help you be relevant, help you be agile, right? There's a whole bunch of AWS code services that can help you ease your day, right? If, there's, if AWS code services do not suit your purpose, there's equivalents like those in other vendors and in third-party pr products as well. And you saw the sweet code star demo with Cloud9, pair programming, my commit messages, and uh, the intentional test unit test failure. Write your unit tests. Um, before I go, Anything that's awesome, anything that you liked, please send it to my Twitter account. And anything that you like, send it to my email. Thank you very much. And now the questions. The questions, oh, all right. Yes. So could developers go through the code review procedure using AVS CodeStar? CodeStar, there is a code commit supports reviewing code. So a code star. Oh, well, the element of a code star or code commit does support code reviews. OK, so next question. Do you think that DevSecOps and DevNetOps is getting merged into what we know as DevOps used to be? So the DevOps versus DevSecOps, it's always a, I think the term DevOps stuck. But I mentioned security is everybody's job, right? Like, not everything is everybody's job, but security is. From you being an application developer to you being an infrastructure developer you need to build in that security. Of course, you will always have an overarching security governance policy mandated by your company or your country or wherever you live in, but everybody has to do security. So DevSecOps, absolutely. But I just use the term DevOps. In your humble opinion, has Kubernetes become a standard that we should all move or is overhyped and not for everybody? Kubernetes. Yes. Kubernetes, OK. So, um, when I was doing, when I, I, I must admit, I started as a Windows admin way back. I have a tattoo to prove it, right? Uh, but I saw the light. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm platform agnostic. So, uh, do not use a technology because it exists. Do not use something because it exists or it's hyped. Use it if it will make sense for you. If running a Kubernetes cluster for you makes a lot of sense, 
absolutely do it. If it benefits your end goal, but if you feel good enough or if you can manage your customers, your customer is your boss, if you can manage your customers by running a standard on-premises server, do that as well. So it's not, you do not have to do X because it's hyped to 11, so. Okay. Do you have ES DevOps tools work without using the, f the full code star stack, like integrate code build as workers to our Jenkins and et cetera? Absolutely, so you can. So uh, you can trigger code build jobs from Jenkins. You can directly deploy from Jenkins using code deploy. So we made inter integrations with those things. I've showed all of these, but as I mentioned, you can mix and match different services with each other, and most of them work. Not everything, but most of them work with, e with good with each other. What is the difference between implementing DevOps in corporation and small startups? Uh, it's difficult, more difficult to do it in a corporation. I used to work for AT&T, and AT&T is this massive government-ish kind of company that moves super slow. Doing such changes there, doing DevOps there, was considered blasphemy at one point, right? Like, how do you mean deploy every day? What? Startups, it's easier. Startups have the agility. You have a small team. This is the concept of two, two, pizza, teams, two pizza teams. A startups, startup is, by default, a two pizza team. And you eat a lot of pizzas, I guess. But it's much easier to do it in a startup than in an than in enterprise environment. But the trend we see on our customers is that everybody is moving towards DevOps because it helps them stay relevant and move faster. And the last question. This all looks nice, but how much will it cost at the end of the month? Um, what, Cloud9? Yes. Cloud9, aha. Uh -huh. If you run Cloud9 for eight hours a day for a month, in the smallest instance, it costs $4, roughly. So it, the only cost of Cloud9 is the cost of the underlying EC2 instance, and that's it. Cloud9 in itself doesn't cost anything. Code pipeline costs $1 per active pipeline, whatever that means, per month. Code build is a couple of cents per minute. Code deploy is free if you deploy to AWS. And code commit is free for the first five users, and everything else is $1 per user per month. So the entire demo I did was maybe a dollar. Yeah, that Thank is you. all. Thank you very much. Thank you.